Hi there, this is Eric for Otoy. In this video, we're going to take a look at the path trace kernel type and the settings that control it. The path trace kernel type is probably the best choice for balancing a realistic, a photorealistic render quality with a reasonable render time. So it's more realistic or more physically based than direct lighting, but doesn't take as much time as PMC. So let's go down to the settings here. So once again, just a review, to get to the kernel settings, you can go into the render settings under Octane Render tab and render settings, you can find kernel down here. So I've created a new render kernel and I've set it to path tracing. So a lot of these settings are similar to the ones that you'll find in direct lights. We're going to focus on those that are, are somewhat different. So for example, max diffuse depth is similar to diffuse depth found in direct lighting. Uh, with, uh, within ray tracing, it controls the maximum number of times a ray can bounce or reflect or refract off of a diffuse or very rough surface. So higher values mean that the render times are going to be longer, but the results are more realistic. According to the documentation for outdoor renders, a good setting is around 4 for lighted interiors with natural light and sun and sky, you probably need higher settings. And in the real world, the maximum number of diffuse bounces would probably not go higher than 16. So you really probably don't need higher than 16 for most settings. The specular depth setting uh, is similar, but it controls the number of times that a ray will be bounced off of a refracting surface before dying. So again, if you increase the, the uh, value here, you'll get a bit more color bleeding and more details in transparent materials, such as these glasses here and say the uh, the space helmet here, uh, lower values can introduce uh, artifacts uh, and in some cases can turn refractions into pure black if they're too low. So if I set this all the way down to zero, you can see how these surfaces all turn black. So a setting of 16 is probably good enough for most uh, environments. So let's take a look at caustic blur. So I'm gonna switch scenes briefly here. So I switched over to the Robot and Pilot 01 scene, which shows our space pilot and his robot bartender friend looking at a magnifying glass that's focusing the rays of sunlight onto this box right here. So the, for the most part, the scene looks good, with the exception of the caustic highlight here created by this magnifying glass. And you can see it's extremely noisy. So one way to reduce this noise is to increase the caustic blur. Uh, as you might imagine, it blurs out the caustic light pattern, which will sacrifice some details. So you may need to experiment with this to get the right value, because too high, it's going to make it too blurry, and it's not going to look like a caustic light pattern anymore. But too low, it's going to be somewhat noisy. Another thing you can try doing is reducing the GI clamp. So according to the documentation, the GI clamp clamps the contribution for each path to the specified value. The default setting is extremely high. Uh, probably higher than you need in most cases. So if we can reduce this, which will reduce render time, and it'll also reduce the number of fireflies, which are which are bright spots you see in the render caused by noise. Basically, reducing this value reduces the amount of energy in the scene. So let's bring this down to, say, something like 10. And you can see immediately it does have a difference. It's not quite as bright here on the highlight, but it's a little bit less noisy. 10 might be a little bit too much, so let's try something like uh, 100. So now we're still getting a bright caustic light pattern, still a little bit noisy. So we can start to balance these two settings to see if we can get a better result. At a certain point, if you can't get a nice looking caustic light pattern um, by adjusting these settings, you might want to try switching to the PMC kernel type, which ten, tends to do much better with uh, caustic light patterns. But by playing with these two scenes in this kind of somewhat extreme example, you get a better sense of how these, uh, s these settings work. So a couple other things I wanted to point out in this scene um, when comparing direct light to path tracing. If I set this to direct light, you can see the refraction through the magnifying glass still looks pretty good. So in this case, direct light works very well for that type of refraction. But you'll also notice that the uh, head of the alien seen through the glass shield on the helmet is looking very dim. You can try uh, playing with some of the depth settings here. Um, 
and we're going to switch to, say, ambient occlusion. Of course, that doesn't look realistic at all. But you can see a, a huge difference between direct light and path tracing when it comes to this effect. So this one looks a little bit better um, than direct light. But the objects through the refraction of the magnifying glass look about the same. The other thing I wanted to point out is uh, this ray epsilon setting. If I set this down to zero, you can see a lot of that artifact that I mentioned in the video on uh, the direct light kernel. You can see it here on the surface, obviously on the ground. Sometimes you can see this sort of banding artifact. And sometimes it's fairly subtle and sometimes it's very obvious. But in either case, if I raise ray epsilon, you can see that that artifact starts to go away. So that covers the basics of working with the path tracing render kernel. Uh, in the next video, we'll take a look at PMC.